Hello, Julia, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Amanda. What's it like in the day in the life of Julia Bear? Tell us a little bit about yourself for any of those listeners out there that don't know much about yourself. I know you've done a lot of charity work, haven't you? Um, I have, like, like many, many people, as we get older, we all tend to become, to move away from ourselves and small children and families into what we can do for other people. I think it's quite a, a well-trodden path, isn't it? You spend a lot of your time travelling then around the world, is that right? Um, at the moment, yes, I've hardly, feet have hardly touched the ground. Um, it's, it was never planned, it's just something that's happened, partly with um, charity work that I do for um, NSF. Where are you from? Are you, are you a Londoner? Well, I'm myself, I'm based in Caterham, which is in Surrey, but I do a lot of work within London anyway. Right, right. Because um, you've heard then of Doctors Without Borders. Yes, yes, yes. of course. Uh, which is either Médecins Sans Frontières or Médicaux Sans Frontières. It's all the same organisation. And through the little world, believe it or not, I do do some work with Médicaux Sans Frontières, whose headquarters is in Barcelona. And they are a group of Spanish doctors at the height of their professions. They run gynae clinics. They run the top of the range um, medical clinics all over Spain. And they just love the Beatles. And I met them about 15 years ago and started to work with them with the quarrymen. And we put on concerts all around Spain, part of the traveling, um, to raise money for medical seed contracts. So that is something that I do. That sounds wonderful. It's obviously very rewarding for you. It's very rewarding. <clears throat> I have to confess, enormous great fun. There's one thing, if anyone wants to come and join us, um, it's not organised. Apparently, John, my brother John, was in talks with uh, Salvador Dali, that nutcase with the muzzle, you know, the moustache. And they were talking about doing part of the walk um, the part of the pilgrimage, Santiago de Compostela. And the doctors are really keen for me to do it. And um, I'm appealing, I would need help from lots and lots of people, and I would be doing the shortest walk. But can you imagine John and Salvador Dali? I don't think they'd have got what, from one staging post to the next. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you, you sound like a really busy lady then. But obviously, you're still working within music. I mean, obviously. John spent most of his time working music, and obviously you still are now. Um, I'm not in the I'm not in the, the making of music side. I just happen to be a director but around it. Yeah, but you're still around it though, aren't you? Evidently, John made created music. He was an absolute genius. I am way way back in the shadows of all that. I'm one of the millions working away um, at the industry, the the music industry, if you like, and I love it. I, very fortunate, and it's through John that I'm able to do this. Well, going back to that, you saying that you know, obviously working in the music industry, Brook on the Street is about organic music, and it's about how lots of musicians now uh, try and become successes on their own without the help of a record deal. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're high achievers. They try and help themselves through social media. Obviously, social media is a lot. Wherever it's it now. That's of, that's of course, yeah, that's right. And we know obviously in the days of the Beatles when social media wasn't even around, you know, internet wasn't even around. Um, do you think that um, bands these days can make it more easily rather than... In, because obviously John did try really hard to get out and about. He was out all the time gigging, non-stop gigging. But now, obviously, most bands are now promoting themselves on social media. Do you think it's easier now for, for acts now rather than what it was like then in his day? I think I think there's pluses and minuses. You know, there's things that you can say on both sides. People have said, oh, you know, the Beatles made it overnight. And you've only got to listen to Paul, who rebuffs that instantly. He said, come off it. We did 800 hours of rehearsal. I mean, hard physical graft rehearsal in Hamburg alone before we came back to Liverpool. And they'd done hundreds of hours to be invited to Hamburg. They, the Beatles, as the quarrymen and uh, their various incarnations, worked damned hard to get where they did before they were picked up by um, a record company. I don't know whether it's easier or not. Mm. 
you know, they didn't have access to to anyone more than 10 miles away, did they, without social media. Now you have access to someone on the other side of the world. That's right. It's, I don't know how people cope with the social media aspect, but I know our own business has a whole section devoted to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever, uh, chat, devoted to social media because it is a vital part of any industry nowadays in promotions, isn't it? And the Beatles and John never had access to that. They had to do it with uh, sort of at the chalk face, down at the down in the coal mine. They had to do it the mm. hard way. Well, that's right. It was all definitely done in a different way. I mean, no doubt there's lots of bands now that are going out and doing their shows still. They're still gigging. But obviously, perhaps maybe 60, 70% of it is done on, you know, on social media. Um, going back to John himself and his character, um, he was obviously a very determined, ambitious person. You know, I'd say like yourself in a, in a way as well. You're very similar like that. Do you think he had a very assertive character? Was he always quite assertive? Quite a strong, uh, strong character like that. Character on the outside, but Amanda on the inside, he was like many of us, um, you know, a jelly that wobbles to the touch. He was actually extremely vulnerable, because, but because of life and his own personal life, he um, was determined to forge ahead. You can go one way or the other, can't you? You can either give in and lie down underneath stresses, or you can get out there and sort of literally forge your way, forge a pathway through adversity, which is, I feel, what John did. But inside, he was still that very same vulnerable little boy. Mm, I mean, you know him well, you know, you remember him very well. As yourself, the one question I was dying to ask is, have you ever written a song yourself? Did he ever help you ever to write a song? Or did you ever have that inclination to think, okay, John's writing, I actually feel like writing a song. Was he ever an inspiration in that respect that you wanted to write as well? Well, I think John is a poet. If you look at, his, if you look at the song um, written as a written piece, you can see, I feel, that he is a poetry. Um, before song is lyrics set to melody, isn't it? And Paul came of setting things to a tune, to a very good tune. Um, I see John as a poet, and I have had some poetry published myself many years ago, sort of gave up on that. But I see John as a writer rather than a songwriter. It was set to music. But he's writing the story of his life. It's his autobiography all the way through. I see him as a writer, stroke, poet. Well, they do say a lot of the great songs do come from poetry anyway, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, you yourself are a writer. I think you've written a book as well, haven't you? What led you to write that? And did it bring a lot of memories about John? Was it hard for you to write about him? Yes, it was cathartic, painful, funny. Um, I took two years off. I took early retirement for. Uh, I was a school psychologist, and I took two years early retirement in order to write the book because I've been trying to do it in the evening and the weekends. And the, the job itself, I absolutely loved, and was so demanding. I didn't have any headspace left to get into this writing. So I took early retirement and just sort of hold in and wrote the book. But it took me two years. I'm not a natural writer. I'm not somebody that, you know, sort of uh, reams off a book or anything. I did it because I had a, a purpose, and that was to set our story straight. Mm. Well, I, you know, I have to say, I haven't read your book, but I would really love to read it. So um, I, well, I will probably yeah. read it this summer. I'll send you a copy. No, thank me. you very much. I'd appreciate that. Um, we talked earlier about um, the growth of the Beatles. You mentioned about, yes, they, they didn't actually become famous overnight. It took a long time for them to develop. Now, I run another radio show, which is called Junior Star Singer, which looks at the artist development programme of young children, basically aged between 10 to 16, and how long it takes for them to develop. Um, the Beatles took a long time to grow and to become big, and obviously John was still writing for a long time. Do you think for an artist to become that big a legend, it does take a long time? Because now we've got artists like Adele, we've got people like um, Justin Bieber, and they're all young. They're not old. 
but this this almost being seen now as legendary do you think that's right or not well then it becomes subjective here i absolutely love adele's voice so you know i i can see why she has the celebration that she does i can see why amy winehouse um, became top of her singing mode tree before she sadly died but um you know, it, this is where we come back to it's a different world they've had social media uh, they put out i don't even understand it amanda they put out a disc a, a tune mm. and overnight it's a number of billion 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 one in the whole world it wasn't possible before mm. people mm. had to hoof it to the record shop to buy the record and then someone in a in the bbc is is pointing number one number two they bought three they bought four you know with the top ten every week they bought five they bought six now I don't even understand streaming, downloading, downloading iTunes. I don't even know what they're talking about. I've still got CD. <laughs> well, we're all moving in a different time now. And, and you know, what? I just think it's the way technology is moving. But John himself, he exceeded 14 million albums in US alone and was responsible for 25 number one singles. And that is a, an amazing achievement. So whether or not any one of those legends will get that you know, high, I, do, I really don't know. Will, that, will the, they'll get that much success? I really don't know. However, you know, it's, it stands to reason what, what we're trying to, to investigate is, is it that easy to become a success straight away, really? Or does it happen over time? You know, is it something where you have to grow in the music industry and you have to work for many, many years or it's just sudden that's it, you are a legend? I mean, Taylor Swift now, obviously she's yeah. sold millions. You know, um, millions and millions of records already, and um, ultimately she's seen as in that league. But can anybody compare someone like that to John? That that's the question, really. Well, because he stood for something, didn't he? He definitely he, stood for something. He did. But then, then you see the youngsters today feel that Taylor Swift stands for something. Mm. She she's a great mentor, is isn't she? Yeah. She's documenting her own life. Um, I'm sure she's finished with this, the, the relationship fell apart with the fellow before Tom Hiddleston, I've forgotten who it is. She'll be writing about that. The she's using her life, John did, to, uh, and express it in songs. Mm -hmm. And people, um, it touches them, you know, they recognize it and they move into it and they want to buy it. Now the thing is with John, they had to buy the physical record. With Taylor Swift, I don't even know how they get her stuff. They mm. press the buttons. I don't know how she, I don't know how they pay for it. I've no idea. It's another world. But John was famous, famous, famous in his own right. So is Taylor Swift. And the fact that one was taken five minutes and the other one took uh, ten years, I don't know how you compare those anymore. We've got, we're, I mean, I've just come away from the cavern club, where, I'm in the cavern offices now, just come away from the club and there's hordes of youngsters in there from school who are able to practice in the actual, actual, actual cavern on the actual, actual, actual stage. I mean, it's fantastic, but they're not going to make it overnight, are they? You don't know how these things happen. I don't understand. Well, I'm due to come up now to the Cavern Club to interview some bands at the end of the month. So I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, and I am looking forward to reading your book, Julia, as well. So do send me a copy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, for your um, physical address, your postal address, I'll send Oh, definitely. I'll definitely do that. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And please keep me updated on all your charity work as well because right. um, we it promote youth music as well, uh, very actively on Junior Star Singer as well. So we help all of under, lots of underprivileged kids that can't afford oh, to help themselves in music. So. Really tap into, tap into them and help them solve so many problems themselves. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Thank you very much, Julia. Thanks for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.